and it's a part of our society, but in that day, the cross was an instrument of torture. It was an instrument of death. It was not something to be celebrated. We can celebrate it now knowing that Jesus got off of that cross, went into the tomb, and came out of the tomb and sits at the right hand of the Father. So we can celebrate the cross today, but in this moment, in this time, the cross was not to be celebrated. Verse 35, and the people stood looking on, but even the rulers with them sneered, saying, he saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. Then the soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine, and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And an inscription was written over him in letters in Greek and Latin and Hebrew. They wanted everybody to be able to read it. This is the king of the Jews. Verse 39, then one of the criminals who hanged, blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. There's two things about that passage that are relevant. One, Jesus keeps getting told, If you are the Christ, if you are the Son of God. Remember Matthew chapter 5, that kept saying to Jesus, If you are the Christ, if you are the Son of God. Jesus is being tempted in his death the same way he was being tempted at the start of his ministry. And what that shows us is that sometimes you're going to go through something now that's going to prepare you for what you're going through later. In the, in the first temptation, he was fasting, so he was hungry and he was weak physically. In the second temptation, he was facing death, and he knew that he could have ended it at any moment, but he chose to stay there. He chose to stay there for you and for me. And he knew that in 2017 we would get together and we would have church celebrating what he did and that we would all be in need of the gift of God and the mercy of God that he gave on this same day. Verse 40, but the other thief answering rebuked him saying, do you not even fear God seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive due reward for our deed, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Today you will be with me in paradise. So I want to take that today. And we're going to pray in just a minute, but I want to go off the sin topic of last week and continue with two things. There's two parts to this full message. One of them is God's part, and one of them is our part. God is full of mercy when we are full of repentance. And so God is merciful when we are remorseful. And the topic of my message today is just no filter. And I'll make it make sense in just a minute. No filter. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your promises. I ask that you would be with us in this place today, that we would be able to hear from you, be able to spend time in your presence above all. God, bless the words that would be spoken here today. Let it be your words and not mine, and speak to each heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me give you a sentence. If you write notes, this is a good one. Repentance revives relationships. Repentance revives relationships. Have you ever had a relationship, or, or maybe it was with um, a, 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 a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a husband, a wife, a, a best friend, a cousin, somebody in your life, and, and there was an issue there, and, and you ended up separating the, the, the relationship was in, in a time of peril, you were struggling with that relationship, and all of a sudden you realize that we have to work this thing out, especially if it's like a spouse situation and there's children involved. You have to be civil with that person, at least for the children. And so you have to understand that repentance revives relationships. There are some times that in, rela in, in earthly relationships, in these relationships, that I, I have had to go and, and, and tell someone I'm sorry, even when I didn't feel like I did anything wrong, but I had to fix what was broken between us. I had to fix what was broken here so I could live properly here. And repentance revives relationship. We discussed how sin is a filter last week. How when you look at pictures and stuff on Instagram or social media, there's, you can put filters on different things. And, and that's kind of what sin does in your life. There's a life that you were purposed to live. There's a life that God called you to live. And then there's a life full of filters. 
We put these filters over our, our lives and we say, well, I'm going to filter my life with this addiction. And now when people see me, they're going to go, oh, there goes Jonathan. You know, he's addicted. And we filter our life with the things that are around us. We leave our purpose so we can fill ourselves with filters. God's plan is okay, but it's not attractive if it's unfiltered. That's the way we think. That's the way we live our lives. And it's hard sometimes to determine in today's technological age what is real and what is not. I thought about going on y'all's Facebook page and taking Facebook pictures and, and putting them up here, but I didn't have time to work all that out. And so y'all are lucky because some, some of y'all, might I might have found some real good ones on there, and I would have put them right up there. I would have put on the No Makeup Monday right there, and everybody would have seen you in all your glory. I would have put on the... I would, I would have put on the, like, the, you know, the pictures that you see people post pictures of, like, they have a beard and then they shave it in sections, so they do all the different funny things. With I would have put them up there. I would have put all your pictures, uh, uh, your tutu pictures, wearing tutus and sparkly crowns. It would have all been there. But I ain't have time to get going with that, so um, I didn't do it. But, but <laughs> praise God, Jesus. <she's> You can change anything you want just by adding filters. You can remove blemishes. You can make yourself look thinner. You can give yourself a tan in the way you hold it, the filters you put on it. All this different stuff are ways that you can access a filter to change the way you look. To Have you ever looked at a filtered picture on Facebook and then met that person in real life and been like, this ain't the same person. I don't know what you're trying to do right here, but you ain't, you ain't the person in this picture. You said you look like Jennifer Lopez. You look like Mario Lopez. Don't come at me like that. Don't do that to me right now. And, and so those are, those are some things that are funny. You, you, know, you know, people you generally don't have cat ears and cat noses and tails and stuff. But with Snapchat, you can see what you would look like as a werewolf. It's great. You can put filters on any picture you want, and you can make yourself look different. Filters make people feel good man, I just wasn't feeling myself today. I didn't think I looked good. I didn't think I, I had my hair game right. But boy, that filter came right through. I got a filter that put a hat on my head. And it was all cute. And everybody thought it was funny. And man, it set me right up. I was ready to go after the filter because the filter changed my whole life for a moment. And then you see yourself in a mirror. And you're rem reminded of all the flaws that are actually in there. You're reminded of the things that you don't like. You're reminded of the things that you can't get past. You're reminded of the hurt. You're reminded of, you know, maybe, maybe you look in the mirror and, and you see a scar that reminds you of something that happened when you were a child in a bad situation, and it takes you right back to a place where you don't want to be. So we filter it all out so that we can have peace in our own life, peace in our own heart. And that's the message from last week. That's the sin message. That's what sin does is it filters your life and it lets you look away like you want to look. And then you have to actually see the unfiltered. You see, I used to, I used to live that life. I know what it's like to be, uh, uh, have these issues. I know what it's like to be addicted. I know what it's like to struggle. I know what it's like to feel unloved. I know what it's like to feel like nobody cares or wants me around. And so I filtered myself so much, and I put so much over me, and I said, I don't care about what people think. And it became my identity that I was that guy that didn't care about nobody. And it took me so long after I got out of that lifestyle to realize that caring for people is not a bad thing. Caring for people is actually what Jesus would have us to do. But I didn't want that. I'd been hurt. I'd been mistreated. I'd been beat up. And so I decided I didn't want to do that no more. So I filtered it all out. Apparently, there's a TV show that's all about how people get fake profile pictures and fake profiles and trick other people into getting into relationships with them. And then they find out later down the road that uh, that, that wasn't even a real person. And you got, you got taken for a ride by, like, the football player. What's his name? The played for Notre Dame that had the, the girlfriend in Hawaii or whatever it was. And she wasn't real. She wasn't real. Huh? Man, I tell you, yeah, yeah. He's, nope, nope, nope. He got jacked. And then everybody thought, yeah, that's a whole different message for a whole different day. Filters will mess you up more than they will ever help you. 
And I think Jesus has called us to live an unfiltered life, a life that doesn't have all this extra stuff over it, a life that says, this is what I am. I am Jonathan. I am Dustin. I am Brent. I am whoever God made me to be, and I cannot change what I am because you don't like it. If you don't like what God made me, you don't have to come around here no more. You don't have to talk to me. We don't have to be friends. Nobody's making you get in my car and come to church on Sunday morning. You could say no. <laughs> I'm getting no amens from that one, am I? <laughs> so you pick on me, I pick right back. I don't get it. Because I grew up in a time where there was no filters. I grew up in a time where if you wanted to put pictures on your wall, you had to print them at Walgreens and tape them on your wall. You, there wasn't none of that. You couldn't have, and we did. We had our whole wall pictured with tape pictures all over the wall. And, and so you couldn't change it. When somebody came in your room, they seen all, it was a, it was a terrible quality picture, so like it, it filtered it out by itself, but you were what you were. You couldn't go and have 14,000 Facebook friends and think that you're the most popular person in the world when in reality you sit at home every day because your Facebook friends don't translate to real life friends. Real relationships are what matter. The guy I work with one time, we were talking about something. I said, look through, he was trying to do something on Facebook, tag somebody. I said, just scroll through your friends. He's like, I got 2,000 friends. I said, you, ain't, you don't even know 2,000 people. How do you have 2,000 friends? Because... The way we live online, the way we live through our filters, the way we live through our circumstances change the way we actually live. And we start thinking that there's something going on that's really not going on. But filters make it look good from the outside. And filters make it seem real from the outside. We live in an unrealistic, we live with an unrealistic expectation of people. We think we know somebody because we listen to their music. We think we know somebody because we hear their message. We think we know somebody because we've seen them on Facebook and we've chatted in Instant Messenger. We think we know somebody because of an online filtered representation of who that person is. How many people go to the, on their first date? Anybody ever been like on a blind date? I ain't never done that. Oh, okay. Some, that's a, that must be a lady thing because only ladies said yes to that. So... Dudes are like, I'm just going to get one where I get one, and it's going to be what it is. We ain't messing with none of that. But so, so you go there, and, and, they're like, and they're like, they're like, oh, yeah, he's good looking, girl. He's got it going on. He's got a six-pack, and, like, and then he shows up, and he's got a keg, and you're like, he, was, well, he walked in with a six-pack of Pepsi. That's what he did. He ain't got, that's as close as he gets to a six-pack. Oh, no, he, you should see his hair is beautiful. He walks in bald-headed like me, and you think, listen, I don't know what they, this person told you, but the person that showed up must have gotten the wrong message because that, the, the person you told me about is not the person I had dinner with the other day. Nobody goes on their first date looking a hot mess. You try to make it all nice. You find your best outfit. You put your best clothes on. You do your hair just right. You was, fellas, you will spend an hour and a half. You would, like normal days, you get ready in three and a half minutes. But on a blind date, you're spending two hours in the mirror trying to make sure every hair is right. Everything is going good. You got almost so much pride. You're putting makeup on. You get into something. You, you, you don't even know why you have it, but you're putting makeup on. Things you would never do just to make sure you look good for somebody else instead of just presenting that person who you are. But the problem is, when you live filtered, nobody can really get to the inside. Nobody can really get to know you. Nobody can get to see who you are. Nobody can get a chance to understand and have time with you. And so you, uh, the, the question that we have to ask is, have you ever tried to filter something that doesn't need to be filtered? We spend so much time dressing like other people dress and talking like other people talk and liking what other people like. When I, when I first started doing ministry, I tried to imitate myself after all the people that I seen on TV that were successful. So I would, I would come in like Bishop Jakes and throw my heavy foot down and be like, and God said, and, and, and you know what that got me? Nowhere. Nowhere. It didn't get me nowhere. It didn't get me on TV. I don't got a TBN special. It got me nowhere. I ain't got a talk show. I ain't got nothing. And so I said, I can't do that. And so I would try to imitate the people around me because maybe they got something that I don't got. So I would try to be them. And then I moved to Orlando and I realized because I was with somebody that I, I just couldn't be. And he, and he put these expectations that were really high that I always would strive to get to, but I would always fall short. And so he would say, you have to be better. And I, he said, we can always get better. And to a point, that's very true. 
But then there would be things like, you can't talk the way you talk. You have to talk better. You can't dress the way you dress. You can't act the way you act. You can't say, and these aren't things that he said to me. These are things that we lived. We have to be somebody else. All you can be in this life is you. You don't have to filter something just because somebody else wants to see a different you. You have to be what God placed inside of you. God gave you purpose. God gave you promise. God gave you talents. God gave you wisdom. God gave you giftings. God gave you anointing. God gave you everything he needs you to have. If God needed me to have hair, I wouldn't have lost it already. If God needed me to be thin, then he'd give me a desire for the gym, but you know what? People that go to the gym got a mental condition, I believe. They just like to hurt themselves. I like to sit back when my Dairy Queen blizzard and chill. That's what I like to do. God bless your ministry. Pastor Josh almost spit his coffee out all over his Bible, buddy. He said, he's talking about being fat right here in front of everybody. We get caught up in society's filters so easily. That's what I'm talking about. And we get a case of the ifs. If I can have this, I will be happy. If I can do that, I will be fulfilled. If I can get married, my life will have meaning. If I can get more money, I can finally do the things I've always wanted to do. We can't live on the ifs that we don't have and ignore what we do have. God doesn't call us to live through somebody else's eyeballs. You can't see your life through somebody else and think, well, that person does it this way. I have to. There's nothing wrong with modeling yourself after something successful, but you have to take it and transform it and let it be you. There's nothing wrong with liking a certain style of clothes that's popular. There's nothing wrong with that, but you can't let that define who you are. And listen, Your boy right here ain't ever putting this body in no skinny jeans. It just ain't happening. You know why? You got to have skinny jeans, G-E-N-E-S, to have to wear skinny jeans. And this dude don't got it. Okay? I, I might could get one leg in some skinny jeans, and that's about it. You know how like people wear them skinny jeans, them young kids, and then they got them all pulled down like this? At least when my pants fell back in the day, it was because they was 14 sizes too big, and I ain't have a belt. These cats got jeans that are so tight, their ankles can't breathe, and they got to hold them up because they're falling down some kind of way. You ain't never seeing this dude like that. And I don't care how much society says, well, skinny jeans is in right now. They ain't in here. They ain't in this closet. I don't care how many people say, if you want to be successful as a church, you got to be relevant. You can't wear suits and be successful in church. You can't have notes and be successful in church. You got to wear pants with holes all in them. And you got to wear T-shirts that look like dresses that come down to your knees that are ripped up. And you got to wear some sort of leather jacket when it's 150 degrees outside. And you can't ever be successful because you can't do the stupid swoop haircut like all the other cool, relevant hipster pastors do. And so you just, you just got no hope. Get off my back. I don't care what they do. God didn't call me to be them. He called me to be me. He called me to do what I can do. And I think when we get a hold of that good news to say, I don't have to live up to somebody else's standards. I can be what God called me to be. I can do what God called me to do. Then we live in a level of freedom that we never thought we could reach. And that's good stuff. We identify ourselves by filters that other people put in front of us. And then we lose our identity because of what they say. And we lose our freedom because somebody else puts bondage on us that we can't get out of. Well, they don't like me, so I have to do whatever. The other day, Chastity, I don't remember what it was we was talking about, but she said something about somebody not liking her. And she goes, and that's ridiculous because everybody likes me, and she needs to like me too. And I'm tired of it. I don't know what the problem is, but I'm going to get to the bottom of this because everybody needs to like me. It was her little rant she was having. And I thought, if people don't like you, who cares? Who cares? Who cares? You cannot allow somebody's dislike or disdain for you to keep you held back from what God has called you to do. I don't care if people like the way I speak. I don't care if people like the way I look. I don't care if people like the fact that I get loud and crazy. I don't care what. This is what God's called me to do. I'm going to do what God's called me to do the way I feel like he's calling me to do it. And, and that's just the way it's going to be. It's got, you got to get like this. You got to say, I'm so bad. I am so bad that nobody else can do what I do like I do what I do when I get ready to do it how I do it. Say that to somebody. Yeah, it took me a long time to learn that without messing it up. 
Well, nailed it. Crushed it. So what is repentance? If we're supposed to be a remorseful people and we're supposed to access this freedom by repentance, what is repentance? Well, in Greek, it's the word metanoia. And it literally means a transformative change of heart. It's a complete changing of your mind. It's almost like saying you busted a U-turn and you're going the other direction. Metanoia is, is, is changing what you used to be to changing and lining yourself up with, God, with what God has called you and placed you on this earth to be. It, it, there, there, it's, a, it's a central theme in the Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, you will see God calling people back from the flood or from, from the first fall of man. When Adam sinned, God hit the garden and the Bible says he was walking through the garden and he called out to Adam and said, Adam, where are you at? And Adam came out and said, well, I hid myself because I was afraid. And God said, who told you? Why were you afraid? Did you eat from what I told you? You know, we talked about it last week. But the very first thing God did was cover sin with sacrifice and call Adam in the garden. Adam, where are you? And then you get to the book of Revelation and you will see that Jesus is coming back and that he's not going to stay gone forever. He's going to leave us for a time. But when he comes back, we're going to live in, in perfect righteousness with him forever. He's going to come down. He's going to take away our sin. He's going to take away our pain. Those of us who are in a relationship with him, those those of us who are called by his name and those of us who, is, who have accepted the gift of repentance and, and grace and mercy that he gives, we are going to spend eternity with Jesus forever. In fact, if you end up spending eternity somewhere other than with Jesus, it's because you chose it and he honored your free will choice. From Genesis to Revelation, God is calling people back. He's, he did it with the Apostle Paul, somebody who spent so much time trying to kill and hurt and, 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 and do away with Christianity. And, and, and God, Jesus knocked him down to the ground and stripped his vision and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you? Who are you? What's the deal? He said, it's Jesus. It's Jesus that you're persecuting. One translation says it's hard for you to kick against the goads. The goad was a big stick that had a point on the end that they would use to move oxen from one point to the other. And what, what, what Jesus was saying is that, is that it's hard for you to kick against what I'm trying to do in your life. It hurts you more than it hurts me because I'm trying to put you where I need you to be and you're trying to kick it away. But kicking against Jesus is always going to hurt you more than it hurts Jesus. Kicking against your purpose is always going to hurt you more than it hurts your purpose. Kicking against God's plan for your life is always going to hurt you more than it hurts God's plan he's trying to get us on the path he calls us to be he's crying out to us and saying Dustin please come back to me and it's our choice to accept the gift or not it's illustrated greatly in Hosea God goes to Hosea and tells Hosea I want you to go find you a prostitute and marry her and I'm thinking <laughs> do what <laughs> do do what Go find you a, go down to, you know, I don't know here, but, you know, go down to OBT. Go, go, to, go down, get you, get you a prostitute. That's an Orlando reference for y'all Fort Wayne folks. Jerry knows what it's about. Uh, go, go, down, go down there, get you a prostitute, and, and then, and, oh, no, he doesn't know like that. He knows. <laughs> Hold on, let me clarify. He don't know like he knows. He knows because he stayed at a hotel on that road, and he's seen it. He, his wife was with him. Look, he's sweating now. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, why y'all tripping? All I'm, I'm telling the truth. He's seen it for himself. Okay. <laughs> Jerry, you got struggles now, buddy. <laughs> it's it's going to be the talk of the town now. Did you hear Jerry went to Orlando? And got, that's not what I meant. Y'all need to just be thinking more, more spiritual up in here. <laughs> hey, uh, um, I don't remember what I was talking about, but Hosea said... Uh, or God told Hosea, go get you a prostitute and make her your wife. And Hosea goes, okay. And he went down and found him Gomer, which if you're looking for a baby name, Gomer is out there for your uh, availability. And, um, and he, got her, he got him Gomer, and he said, listen, you're the one for me. And she's like, but I'm a prostitute. And he's like, that's exactly what I'm looking for. And so he grabs her, and he, he wipes her up, and then they're, they're doing what they do. And then all of a sudden, the Bible says that she goes back to live in prostitution. And, 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 and Hosea's like, I, I did what you said, and this is what happened. And God said, now I want you to go find her. And the Bible says it like this. He says, I want you to go find your wife, even as she's being loved by another man right now. 
and I want you to forgive her. And I want you, so Hosea goes looking for his wife, and he goes to the, to, the, to the trading block, and he goes to where all the prostitutes and all the human trafficking is done, and he goes, and he says, have you seen my wife? Have you seen my wife? And they're like, no, I ain't seen her. Have you seen Gomer? Have you seen my wife? I'm looking for my wife. And he finds her, and she's up there, and she's ready to be sold into slavery. She's ready to be sold into trafficking. She's ready to go back to prostitution. And he says, I need her. I will pay for her. And, and, and Hosea gets out his money, and he pays for his wife. He pays for the relationship that is already his. And God says, if you will do this for your wife, will I not do this for Israel? And God would tell us today, if I can have Hosea marry a prostitute and I can have him love her again to illustrate my love for my people, why would you continue to walk away in sin? Why would you continue to leave away from me? I am trying to get you back. I am trying to get in a relationship with you and you keep choosing somebody else. You keep filtering your life. You keep doing this. Metanoia produces mercy. Mercy and repentance go hand in hand. You cannot have true repentance if God is not truly merciful. Mercy and repentance go hand in hand. Mercy will leave the multitude. Luke 15, there's a lost sheep. And, and, and the Bible says that the shepherd will leave the 99 sheep that he has to find the one sheep that has gone away. And that's what God does in our... And I'm so thankful that when I was that one sheep, that Jesus stepped in and he walked away from the other 99 and he came and found me because there was something that he needed me to do that I couldn't do living the lifestyle. I was in. There was something that he needed to pull me out of. There was addictions in my life that he needed to break off. There was pain in my life that he needed to heal. There were struggles in my life that he needed to get me past. And he left the sheep that he had to come find the one that was lost. And if you're sitting in the room today and you're lost, I want to tell you, Jesus is leaving the 99 just for you. He's leaving the multitude to find you. Why would Jesus leave so many just for me? Because he has so much mercy. Mercy, mercy, and repentance. Repentance and mercy. James 2.13 says, mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Hosea 6.6, 6, God desires mercy more than sacrifice. God desires mercy more than sacrifice. God's desire is that we enter into a relationship with him, but one of my favorites in the whole Bible is, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love. I love when the Bible says, but God, because it shows me there's something greater coming. But God, you're sinners. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love. But God, who took me out of the pain I was in. But God, who fixed my broken marriage. But God, who took me out of bankruptcy. But God, who gave me a new, uh, a new future. But God, who showed me my purpose. But God in my life will Always eliminate the need of a filter. That was your chance to shout and clap and praise God, but you blew it. It's all right. My cheering section will be back before you know it. Mercy and grace are abundant throughout God's word. It was there when Abraham went to sacrifice his son. Mercy and grace was there when David looked at Bathsheba on the roof and said, I got to have her. Mercy and grace was there when Jonah ran from God and did whatever he could do to get away from God's presence. But it doesn't stop in the Bible. Mercy is here when we feel like we can't go on. Mercy is here when we feel like we're not good enough. Mercy is here when we feel like we're going to fall. Mercy is here to help us get back up and put us on our feet and say, I'm fixing you up. I'm changing something in you. You don't have to live like this no more. You don't have to be depressed no more. You don't have to be broken no more. You can have peace. You can have a future. You can have hope because of mercy in your life. Amen. It's time to live the life that God has intended us to live. Mercy and repentance is something that is a, a, a direct result of personal acceptance of responsibility. When I was young, I could never do that. Anytime something got wrong, even if I did it, I would look at my mother right in her eyeballs and I would say, my brother did it. And you know what my brother did? He took the punishment every time. And I would just let him have it. And he would get whooped, and I would sit there and let him have it. Because that's the person that Jonathan was. 
I was more concerned about me than anybody else. And it didn't stop there. That's how I went through all my life and and moving up and, and doing new things. I always cared about me more than anything else. I want to give you three characteristics of true repentance and true mercy. I want to give you a few characteristics of what that looks like. First of all, in verse 41, and we need justly for we receive Sorry, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due rewards for our deed, but this man has done nothing wrong. The first characteristic of true repentance and true mercy is that it's an unashamed resolution. It's an unashamed resolution. This thief hanging on a cross said, we deserve to be here, but this man is innocent. We deserve this because of what we did. He's resolving in himself to say, I am a guilty person. Resolution is defined as a formal decision. It's when you decide that you can only be on this ride for so long before you start feeling sick. We went to Universal one time with Pastor Josh, and he's hanging his head in shame because he knows what's coming. We got got him to get on the Hulk roller coaster. And let me tell you something about Universal if you plan to go there. Them rides are not big people friendly, so you might as well take it on down to Disney or something else if you want to ride roller coasters because them rides, I, I, like they're sitting there pushing it down on me, and I'm like, you're about to fracture something inside of my, this part of my body. You better stop. But we get him on there, and we're all buckled in, and, and, and we're going, and he's tripping the whole time. He's, he doesn't, and the line's like, like an hour and a half wait, so the whole time it's just psychological torture to him because he's like, in just a few, in, in just a few minutes, I'm going to get on this machine. It's going to shoot me from zero to 75 in like a half of a second, and it's going to be great. That's not what he thought at all. He thought he was going to die. And so we got on there, and, and we're enjoying the ride, and we're hollering and screaming, and we're going upside down and underneath the bridge, and the pictures are taken and cameras and all that stuff, and, and people are screaming, and Josh is sitting there like this. He don't want no part of it. He don't, he, we, get, we stop at the end of the thing. It lasts like 30 seconds. I don't know how long it is, but it doesn't. He goes, let me out, let me out, let me out, let me out, let me out. He's trying to pull the thing, let me out. Unlock oh, this button, push the thing, I gotta get out, I gotta get out. And Stephanie looked over, she goes, if you puke on me, <laughs> we gonna have problems. That is what an unashamed resolution looks like. I can only do this for so long before I have to resolve to get out of it. I cannot be here. This was not meant for me. I was never meant to be in this situation. I was never meant to be broken. I was never meant to be this depressed. I was never, it's all about a testimony. And you cannot have a testimony until you go through the test. First thing I ever spoke in a church, I was fresh off the street, fresh out of everything I was in, and the youth pastor at the time came up and said, hey, we're having a youth thing, and I'd like to know if you'd like to give your testimony. And I knew nothing about church, so I'd never heard the word testimony, so I was like, what is that? He said, well, what I want you to do is get up in front of everybody and tell them about yourself. And I said, (laughs) see, because what you got to know about me is I don't, I was never going to be into this public speaking thing. Funny. And, And he goes, I want you to get up in front of these kids and tell them all about you. And I said, no. And then I said, okay, I'll do it. And this literally, it was the worst thing I've ever done in my life. I was very quiet. This is what the whole thing was. I held the microphone right here, okay? And I went like this. I stood right on the edge of the first step, and I kept going like this. And then, you know, I used to do this. And and then that was kind of what my life was all about. I had stayed real quiet like this, real monotone. Didn't raise my voice, didn't walk around, didn't even look at people, kept my head down the whole time. I was like, and I just kept going up and down on that one step like a goofball. And, and it was the worst, probably the worst message that any person had ever heard in their life. I gave no Bible scripture, I gave no nothing, because all he did was ask me to tell him about myself, so that's what I did. And then I, I, got, I was so nervous, I, couldn't, I thought my mouth was going to glue shut because it was so dry. So I, I handed him the microphone, and I walked right out through the back door, and I went to the water fountain to get a drink. And my brother came out there, and he goes, hey, man, you got to come back in there. You got to come back in there because my brother was there because he was there to support me. I said, I ain't got to go back in there. My job is done here. I ain't never got to do that again. <laughs> and then, um, and then and he goes, no, no, for real, every single person in that room is up front crying and praying. They want you to come back in and see what's happening. And I thought, I didn't even say nothing good. And, 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 and what the youth pastor told me was, people will 
will learn more by hearing about a testimony, hearing about somebody else's struggle, hearing about somebody else's life than they ever will if you come in here with this three-point in a poem message. People want to know that there is a real God that moves in real people's life that have real struggles, and that's what God did in me. You cannot have the testimony until you have the, the, the test. And one of my favorite testimonies came from one of my favorite prophets, Isaiah. In Isaiah 6, 5, he said, Woe is me, because I am undone. Woe is me. I am undone. Woe is me. I'm a mess. And it happened because he was taken right to the presence of God and he looked on a holy God and he's seen his sin and he's seen his filters and he's seen everything that he was dealing with and he hit the ground and he said, woe is me. I am a man of unclean lips and I live amongst the people of unclean lips. And God said, but I need you to do what I called you to do. I need you to tell people about my son. I need you to, to prophesy this word. And God had to take coals, hot coals from the altar and put him in Isaiah's mouth to clean what was broken in his life. See, when you go to God and you give him everything you are, he will clean the broken things. He will heal the broken things. He will fix the things that you need him to fix, and he will put you on a place where he needs you to be. But it all started in Isaiah's life with a testimony, an unashamed resolution. Woe is me. The second thing, it's an unexpected restoration. I didn't expect to be healed. I didn't expect for this to happen. Verse number 42, then Jesus said, Lord, or then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I didn't, the thief didn't expect Jesus to do anything. He just wanted to clear his conscience before he died, I think. And he said, Lord, remember me when you get to your kingdom. An unexpected restoration. Restoration is a process. It's not an overnight thing. John, Les John Wesley spoke about praying and fasting for 40 days to make sure his repentance was true. We take it so, so slow that we, we pray and we lift our hands and, and we say, I, I want to pray. I need to repent. I need to accept Jesus. And we do it. And we're timid about it. We don't want people to see us. John Wesley said, I, 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 I prayed for and fasted for 40 days to make sure my repentance was real. You know, growth comes over time. Real growth comes over time. Redwood trees are the tallest trees on the earth. They can reach heights of up to 300 feet tall. And they can, uh, they're also the fastest growing trees. They can grow 3 to 10 feet per year. But even with all that growth, a truly mature Redwood forest is made up of trees that are 500 to 1,000 years old before they reach maturity. If you're sitting here wondering why things don't change for you, I gave myself to Jesus. I said the prayer. I said I'm sorry. Why isn't it getting better? It took you X amount of years to get where you're at. It doesn't just fix overnight. It's a process. An unexpected restoration is a process. You know, after Hurricane Katrina, it flooded the city of New Orleans. I got to go to New Orleans um, a little bit, like just two years after the hurricane. And even two years after, there was still so much damage. There was still, there was still uh, apartment complexes still boarded up, and they had the big square with the X in the middle. And one side of the X had the numbers on it, and the other side had the numbers. And then one number meant, like, how many people was in the place, and the other number meant how many bodies they found when they cleaned it out. And so all the stuff was still piled up on the street. And all this stuff was going on. Hurricane Katrina destroyed the city of New Orleans. And it didn't even hit there. It hit Mississippi. But, yeah, I said it like that. But it messed up New Orleans. And, and I watched the news, and, and I seen things going on, and they would go to people, and they would say, your whole life is destroyed. It took you 60 years to build this life, and in a matter of hours, it was destroyed. What are you going to do now? And person after person after person said, well, we're going to stand here and rebuild. They didn't let an attack come in and destroy their future. They didn't let a flood come in and ruin their life. There, there, there are some storms you will face in life, and you can choose to run for them, from them, or you can stand and rebuild. You can say, I'm going to rebuild my faith. I'm going to rebuild my vision. I'm going to rebuild my future. I'm going to rebuild my family. I might have lost it all back there, but I'm going to stand here and rebuild. 
And that's the way when storms come, you have to stand, you have to take up the full armor of God in Ephesians 6. Having done all you can do, just stand there. It doesn't matter if you gain ground, don't lose ground. If you're not moving forward, that's fine, just don't let it knock you backward. Having done everything you know to do, just stand there and be ready for God to do it. The last thing, true repentance is giving something back. To repent is to say, it's not mine no more. I have to give it back to the person who it's rightfully belonging to. The newspapers told a story about Al Johnson. Al Johnson was saved and became a Christian, and that's not the, the biggest part of the story. The biggest part of the story is that when Al Johnson was 19 years old, he robbed a bank. And because of his conversion to Christianity and God putting it on his heart, he felt he needed to go and tell the authorities that he was the one that robbed the bank that never got solved. And he did so. But because of the, state, the statute of limitations, it couldn't, they couldn't charge him for it. So he didn't have to go to jail for it. And then he voluntarily gave every bit of the money that he stole, his portion of it, he paid it back to the bank. Because he knew that repentance meant I have to give something back that's not mine. When you repent and you give yourself to Jesus, it's not just a prayer. It's a giving back of what is not yours. The Bible says that you were bought with a price. You are not your own. You are a child of God. You are his possession. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are made in his image. You are his. So when we repent, it's giving ourselves back to him. It's giving ourselves back to Jesus. I'm going to finish. I'm going to close with this. Repentance is something that's easily given by God. Or mercy is easily given by God. Repentance is our job. We repent. God gives grace. God gives mercy. The problem in churches is that we've been preached so much grace and mercy that we don't understand what the grace and mercy is for. We've been preached uh, so much about repentance, but never about sin, so we don't know what to repent for. That's why this was a two-part thing. We discussed the problem last week, and now this week we're looking at the solution. Repentance is the solution to our problem. Oh, so you're saying if I give myself to Jesus, everything's going to get better. Absolutely not. In fact, it might get worse because now you're a threat. Repentance, if you are given it, you also have to give it. I'm going to tell you something as I close, and some of you know it, some of you don't. I've said it before, but I'm, I'm not going to give you the whole story. I'm just going to give you an abridged version to get to the end. A lot of you know that it, when we first moved to Orlando, I got a phone call from my mother, and she told me that my aunt had died. And people die all the time, and so it was sad. She was my favorite aunt, and so I thought, this is messed up, you know, and then she was, she was really crying really bad, and so I, I tried to calm her down. And after she calmed down, she told me she didn't just die. She was murdered, and she was murdered really, really, like, gruesomely. It was the worst murder in the entire county that, that, that of, it might have been even in the state. I don't know. It was a bad one, huh? It was, a, it, was a bad, it was one of the worst murders the state of Florida had ever seen. And so I'll spare you the details. Just know it was bad. And we go through the whole process. We go through the funeral. They asked me to do the funeral. It was my first funeral. I was, I was not really excited about it, but I had to do it. And so I did it, and I got through that, and we came back. And, and, and over time, I see people so hurt, and they, got, you know, they knew the guy. They caught the guy with the body, and so they knew exactly who he was. He went to, to jail right there. They went through the whole court process. They went through all this stuff, and people are mad, and people are hurt, and people are, are, are just crying to God because why would you let this happen to my sister? Why would you let this happen to my mother? Have you ever been that person that says, why God? Her son found out by watching the news. The police didn't even call him. He found out by watching the news in the morning before work. And he called them. Well, after a while and, and things go and things settle down, you know, after that, and it's never the same. Your life is never the same because you lost a part of your family. And when you lose somebody in that way, such a tragedy, you know, you, you always think about it in the back of your mind. You think, could I have done more? Could I have shown more? Could I have been there more? Could I have been? And, you, and it's easy for regret to hit you. But at that point, you have to understand that it's not your fault. You didn't do it. 
And you have to be there for the people that need you the most. And as the pastor, the only kind of church goer really in the family, aside from, you know, Josh and, and Chastity and us, we were the only real church people. We got an aunt that's a Jehovah's Witness, but we try to keep her out of things. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, I don't, if it goes online, it goes online. Her doctrine is whack. But um, I'm not, hey, what, Rome, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that's what I'm standing on. So I'm sorry if you don't like it, but that's what it is. Um, uh, she looked at, she, they, they, they looked at us and they wanted to know from us, why did this happen? Why did God do this? Why did God allow this? I thought you said God was loving. I thought you said God cared. This is how I know God is not real. And my mother looked at me one time and she said, how in the world can I ever forgive this dude? She said, you mean to tell me that if he repents, God will forgive him? And right then, at that moment, I had to live the things that I've talked about. She said, what if he called you and wanted you to come meet with him as her family member and wanted you to pray with him to accept Jesus? And what if he called you and wanted to say, I'm sorry, and none of us would listen, but he knew you would? What if you were sitting there looking in his eyes, the person that did all these things to her? And I said, well, mom, you might not like my answer but I'm going to forgive him the same way God will. And I don't have to like it, and I don't have to want to, but I have to give the same mercy God gave me. I have to. Last week we discussed there's no level of sin. We put levels on sin. Sin is sin. And I've sinned in my life, and I've let people feel pain before. Pain like we felt now. But God still forgave me. And God still gave me mercy. And God still gave me grace. And not only did he save me from my future, not only did he save me from myself, not only did he save me from hell, but he said, I want to use you. And now I stand here today as a product of God's mercy only because I was willing to repent and give myself completely to him. Where are you at today? Where are you sitting? I'm not talking about the chair you're sitting in. I'm not talking about the city. Where are you at? You leave today. Something happens to you on the way home and you're taken to Jesus. What is Jesus going to say when he looks to you? Is he going to give the mercy that we're talking about? Is he going to give the grace? Or is he going to say you had an opportunity for true repentance and true mercy, but you passed it up because you were too cool to raise your hand in church? Because you felt like your life was good the way it was. You didn't need this grace. Let's pray. God, I thank you. I thank you for your word. I thank you for everything you do. And I pray, God, that right now you would touch hearts. You would speak to us. That we would live in your perfect will each and every single day of our life. God, I pray that as we call out to you in repentance, that you would just pour out mercy. Pour out grace on our life. But that we would understand that if we want you to do your part, we first have to do our part. We have to cry out to you. We have to give ourselves back to you. We have to let you restore us and replace us and fix us.